Thank you, Stephen. Good morning, Central St. Matthew. Good morning. For those of you that are joining us online on YouTube, Facebook, or whatever online streaming service, it's a rainy day here in New Orleans, but we are glad you are with us in your presence online, and we welcome everyone here in the sanctuary. And as an invitation that I've extended before to those of you online, if ever you're here in New Orleans, just drop by on Sunday morning, 1333 South Carrollton Avenue and visit with us. We would love to see you and meet you because we are a church that welcomes everyone, regardless of who you are, where you are, how you dress, how you identify yourself, how you don't identify yourself. You are welcome here. We consider ourselves a multiracial, multi-ethnic, and a progressive church. And your presence here makes us that more progressive, multiracial, and multiethnic. Thank you for being here this morning. Just a brief announcement this morning. February is Black History Month, and we, in, in fashion, will celebrate Black History Month. On February 12th will be our featured Sunday, and we welcome Brenda Billups Square co-pastor at Beecher Memorial Congregational UCC. She's also the archivist, librarian, and pastor there. And we, she will um, present the featured sermon or the sermon for that day. Uh, we have been in conversation with the Cultural Consciousness Committee. And I think we have centered on a theme for that. And it follows the national theme, which is adopted by the 
National Museum of um, Black History. It is Black Resistance, A Journey to Equality. You want to find out more about it? Be with us next Sunday and the following Sundays. I think Pastor Brockett also has an announcement for us. I simply would like to extend our love and sympathy to Juliana Starr, whose mother, Dee Dee Starr, passed away this past week in uh, Clive, Iowa. Uh, she had just recently celebrated her 95th birthday, and Juliana had been able to be with her in Iowa and to celebrate that birthday, and then she passed away. So we extend our love and our sympathy to Juliana and to her family, and we ask God's memory or God's peace um, upon the memory of Dee Dee Starr. And I get to say to you again, good morning. That was as my role as Wilson Bowen. Now I'm Michael Bucre. <laughs> so welcome to, to this morning's service. Let us stand together and speak our call to worship. I invite you to stand and join with us as I mentioned. And before we do that, how about we have an introit? Thank you. didn't want to miss that welcome. So now let us stand together and speak our call to worship. I will speak the words in the bold. Excuse me. You will speak the words in the bold. <laughs> I want to follow in my great leaders. <laughs> With what shall I come before the Lord? How shall I bow down before God the Most High? Shall I bring some sort of sacrifice? Would that please the Lord? Shall I give up what I love most dearly in exchange for the sins I have committed? The Lord has shown us mortals what is good and what is required of us. To act justly, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Let us worship God together. And I ask you to open the insert of your bulletin. In your bulletin, there is an insert. God bless your church with strength. Please lead us choir.
And now together let us speak our invocation. We come before you, O God, to praise you. We bow down, acknowledging you and no other as our Lord. May our worship be pleasing to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Our readings this morning are two of my favorite scriptural reason, readings. The first from the Old Testament, from the book of Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, and then our gospel reading from the book of Matthew. But first, Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? And what have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? 
Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God? Our gospel reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely, just on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. morning to those of you online. How are you all this morning? Tired? I hear you. How about you? How are you this morning? You stayed up late last yesterday. Are you tired this morning too? Yeah? I'm a little tired this morning. It's okay to be tired, but you know what? We still came, which is good, isn't it? Right. So we just heard several scriptures, and there was one that said something about acting justly and loving mercy and walking humbly with God. You guys jot that down and memorize that when you were sitting there, right? No? Do you know what it means to walk humbly? I'm going to focus on just the last little bit. What does it mean to walk humbly? Any idea? That's why I'm focusing on walking humbly. I'm still figuring it out, too. I was hoping they'd be able to tell me the answers. But we're all working on it together, aren't we? Maybe that's part of our answer? I don't know. So this is kind of a conversation between this guy named Micah and God. And he's trying to figure out what it is he's supposed to do in order to live and honor God, right? So OK, walking humbly. How do you guys walk? You walked down here, or did you run down here? You walked down here? You ran. Did you walk or run? You walked? Let's, let's, let's practice walking. OK, let's walk around just a little bit. Just right here. How are we walking? 
Are we using our feet? Feet are amazing, right? God gave us feet. Well, most of us got feet. Some of us didn't get feet. And some of us injure our feet sometimes when we limp, don't we? But we still have these wonderful feet. Now, when we're walking around, how would we walk around if we are walking because we're happy? What would that look like? Would that look different? Let's walk around if we're happy. How how does that look like? Yeah? Okay. What does it look like if we walk when we're sad? We're walking sad. Yeah. Walking proud. Yeah? Walking humbly. (laughs) Kind of stuck. We're just kind of walking, aren't we? Well, I have a book that might help us figure out a little bit of what it means to walk humbly. Let's see if we can get some clues in this book. Okay. Look at your family, see sisters taking turns on the slide and brothers sharing a new game. How are they walking? See how everyone comes together to help with How are they walking? Happy? But they're helping each other, aren't they? Is any one of them saying that they're better than the other person, or are they helping each other? They're helping each other. Let's check out the next page. Um, Look at your school. A boy helps when another kid can't reach. A girl shares her lunch. They're showing the swings to a new friend. How are they walking? They're not all walking, are you? Are they? This, This child's in a wheelchair. They're rolling. But how are they walking with each other? Are they being kind? Helpful? They noticed when somebody doesn't have something and they're trying to help out? Yeah? How about this? Look at your town. One family gives money for people who lost their home. That would be scary, wouldn't it? A neighborhood gathers books for children who are in the hospital. And look, everybody is helping somebody with a family that has a new baby. They're all kind of pitching in with food and stuff, aren't they? How are they all walking? Happy. Why do you think they're walking happy? Because they're helping. They've noticed people have needs, and they're helping with those needs of each other. They're treating each other kind of like family, even though it's a town, aren't they? Look in the mirror. Can you, have you ever visited somebody who was lonely? Have you ever had a friend who was lonely, and you sat with them? Yeah. Um, have you ever picked up trash, maybe on the playground? Yes. Um, have you ever collected toys or, or mittens or something for children who didn't have any? Or food? We collect food here for people who don't have any, right? See that at church. With little hands and big hands, with little feet and big feet, right? That's how we walk humbly with God. We do it together with no one person getting a big head all by themselves. I guess that's a way of putting it. So let's say a prayer, okay? Because that's what God wants us to do. God wants us to to act and walk humbly with each other. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you for bodies and hands and feet and for being able to walk humbly with each other through this world. Help us to use our bodies to show the way you love us to the world, especially whenever we stick up or help people, even if they're hurt by others and help, help them to feel better. Help us to offer forgiveness to those who have hurt someone and even ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me for the story this morning. You are welcome to go to Children's Church and I'll join. I'll invite you to join with me in our call to reconciliation. But in our time of prayer this morning, there are things that go on around us for which we bring into prayer. And the one thing I'd ask you to bring into prayer this morning is Tyree Nichols. 
in the city of Memphis and all the things that happen in all of our cities, but particularly Tyree Nichols. In Psalm 15, we read, O Lord, who may dwell with you in the holy places? Those who are without blame, who do what is right and speak the truth from their heart? Thanks be to God that in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven and we are given the encouragement to do what is right. So let us join together in confession, speaking from the heart, our unison prayer of for forgiveness. Compassionate God, we come before you to admit that we are not without blame, for we do not always do what is right. We do not always speak the truth as you desire for us to do. We can be unkind and hold grudges when you ask us to be kind and forgive. We can be ungenerous with our time and resources when you ask us to share from our abundance. We can walk far from the path you desire for us to walk, and we can find it difficult to make our way back. Forgive us, O oh God, and dwell within our hearts always. And hear us in the silence as we pray and confess to you. None of us is without sin. None of us is without blame. But the good news that we must remember is that we have this promise from our God that we speak together. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And I ask you to stand now and in that peace, that, that humility that we come to from prayer, Christ left his peace for us to share with each other. Peace signs, kisses, and hugs, and knowing that peace begins with each one of us. And I'd ask you to remain standing and take the book, The Faith We Sing. And it is around, and I'm going to ask Stephen to lead us in how we are going to do this round in collaboration with the choir. Get next to a choir member.
Amen. So everyone has to go to YouTube and see how did it come out. Mm -hmm. That's what the church is intended to be. A harmonious gathering of the people of God. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everyone. Lord God, we offer these moments to you asking uh, that you would be with us. And so I ask each of you just to take a deep breath. Inhale. Hold it. Exhale. And let us all commit ourselves and do our very best to be present together in this moment. Let us let go of those cares and worries. Let us silence our busy minds. Let us calm our troubled hearts. Let us be present here with each other and with God and with the word. May it be so. Amen. One day during the pandemic, Arthur Brooks was walking down the bedroom hallway of his house, going past his daughter's room, and as he went past her doorway, he glanced inside, expecting to see her there in sort of a uh, dismal state in front of Zoom, which was the substitute for school. But when he walked by her doorway, he looked in and he saw that she was doubled over, laughing exuberantly. He stopped stuck his head inside, and looked over her shoulder to see what she was watching on her laptop. What is it, he asked. Well, she laughed. It's an old man singing and dancing like a chicken. She laughed uncontrollably. Arthur saw immediately over her shoulder that it was the rock star Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones. Mick Jagger had just turned 80, and he was celebrating in concert with thousands of baby boomers and Gen Xers in the audience. I can't get no boom, boom, boom. I can't get no dancing like a chicken. I can't get no satisfaction. Do people actually like this? Her da his daughter laughed. <laughs> like it, he said indignantly, shifting into parental lecture mode. <laughs> this song first came out in 1965, and it has stood the test of time. It is number two on the Rolling Stone magazine's list of the 500 greatest rock and roll hits. And do you know why he demanded of his daughter? It's because satisfaction in life is one of the hardest things to achieve. We crave it. We believe that we can get it. We glimpse it. We even maybe experience it for a moment, and then it vanishes. But we never give up our quest for satisfaction. And that's why Mick Jagger sings, and I'll try, and I'll try, and I'll try, and I'll try, but I can't get no satisfaction. He told her all of this with a tone of superiority. And after he'd finished, there was no laughter on her lips, and there was no humor uh, on her face. Instead, there was fire in her eyes as she challenged him and said, So, Dad, 
what you're telling me is that life is a rat race and we're doomed to an existence of dissatisfaction. And then with teenage insolence, she concluded, that sucks. <laughs> Can I say that in a sermon? I just did. Because, you know, the thing about kids is they tell it like it is. Arthur Brooks' daughter is right. We crave satisfaction, we crave happiness, but it so quickly slips out of our grasp. We crave it, we think we find it, we feel it for an instant, and then it disappears, poof! And we go right back to looking for it again. We're always on the search for satisfaction. How can we find and hold on to happiness? The question is as old as the human race, and it is as current as today. And we all dance around like chickens searching for satisfaction. If you don't believe me, then look at our Old Testament text this morning from Micah. Micah is a keen observer of what's taking place in his day. And what did he see? He saw people in a rat race searching for satisfaction. Jerusalem's leaders and authorities had abandoned their obligations to provide for the well-being of the community for the cost of a bribe. Priests for a price. I should have thought of that. It would be a good, a good thing. Priests for a price. Priests for a price had allowed themselves to be influenced by the rich and the powerful to say and to teach what the rich and the powerful wanted to hear. And prophets who knew which side of the bread of their bread was buttered uh, would foretell a future uh, for the politically powerful, the future that the politically powerful wanted to hear. People were trying to get satisfaction, to get ahead in business and government and religion by the use of unjust and corrupt practices. Sounds kind of like our world today, don't you think? But it wasn't just people in authority. It was also people of means and substance. Wealthy landowners and wealthy people were exploiting the vulnerable people. Micah says they covet fields and they seize them. They bully their neighbors to get as much as they can out of them. They defraud a man of his home or a neighbor of his inheritance. In Jerusalem, the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. And this was happening already on a playing field that was not even. And seeing all this corruption and observing everyone in the rat race to get ahead, realizing the inequities that were being promoted, Micah peered into the future and he prophesied disaster. Jerusalem, he said, will become a heap of rubble. Why would they be punished in this way, the people wondered. Because, says Micah, they had not been satisfied with the goodness that God had given to them. The Lord brought them out of Egypt and redeemed them from the land of slavery. But were you satisfied? asked Micah. The Lord sent Moses to lead you and sent Aaron and Miriam to help. But were you satisfied with their leadership? And remember your journey to the promised land and how you crossed the Jordan on dry land. Were you satisfied? asked Micah. God did all of this for God's people. And yet the people of Israel and the people of Judah can't get no satisfaction. And instead of joining, enjoying the good life that God had given to them, they resorted to corruption and injustice to satisfy their desires and expectations. And no matter what they achieve or attain, they still wanted more, 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 more. Sounds like us, doesn't it? I think so. I recently met a man, a man who is very bright and very successful and apparently, to listen to him, very wealthy. As I made his acquaintance, do you know what he wanted to talk with me about? He wanted to tell me how much tax he paid. 
He said that he earns every dollar that he gets and that he pays 50% of his earnings in taxes. Now, I found that statement interesting because the highest tax bracket for this year for a married couple filing jointly, which he is, is 37%. And that 37% is only on income above $647,000. Perhaps he adds in Louisiana tax and FICA, but still, it would be hard to get to 50%. Still, that's a lot of money. And why is he telling me this, I wonder? To brag? No, it seemed more like a complaint. He didn't seem to be able to stop himself. And so the conversation went on. And he told me that despite all the taxes that he paid, that in order to put up a shed in his backyard, a very nice shed, a $10,000 shed, that he couldn't do that without having to go and get a permit. And then complaining loudly, he said, I wonder if the people living under I-10 in tents had to get a permit to put up their tents. And then he said to me, now you tell me who's free. Implying that the people in the tents are more free than he is. Talk about feeling entitled. Talk about lack of gratitude. Talk about lack of concern for our city or for our society or for the poor uh, and the displaced. For all of his hard work, and he works hard, I know he does, and for all of his money because he's way pay, way, very well paid because he's an extremely skilled person, and for all of his possessions, here is a man who can't get any satisfaction. Don't misunderstand me. I don't tell you this story to make fun of him or to hold him up for ridicule. I feel compassion for this man. Because if ever there was a man who is caught in the rat race of life and at the same time is doomed to an existence of dissatisfaction, it is him. And if we're honest, it's us. When Micah observed that this was the case with the people of his day, he spoke strong words. He said, the Lord Almighty has a case against you. Now, this caught some of the people's attention, and they asked Micah, well, then, what shall we do in order to be able to come before the Lord? They were interested in at least appeasing God, if not pleasing God. Shall we come before the Lord with burnt offerings and year-old sac sacrifices, or ca sacrifices of year-old calves? No, said the prophet. Forget about your burnt offerings. Well, then, said the people, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? No, said the prophet. God not, will not be pleased with rams and with oil. Well, then what shall we do, the people cried. Shall we offer the firstborn, our firstborn as a sacrifice to the Lord? This suggestion was particularly distasteful because while other neighboring religions practiced human sacrifice, the Lord and the people of God had never practiced human sacrifice. And so when the people asked this question, the prophet turned them down flat saying, no way. Like so many of us today, the people of Jerusalem wanted to cut a deal with God. They wanted to make a bargain with God. They were lifting up a foxhole kind of prayer, you know, the kind that maybe we pray where we're in grave danger or maybe we receive bad news from the doctor about our health and we find ourselves immediately praying something like, heal me, Lord, and and I'll give more time to the church, or heal me, Lord, and I'll, and I'll be more faithful in my stewardship. These foxhole prayers are understandable, but the problem is they don't bring us any closer to God. They end up being transactional instead of relational. They send the message that we want to show our appreciation to the Lord, but we really don't want 
to alter our lives so that we can be closer with the Lord. This seemed to be the case with the people of Jerusalem. They would be happy to bring burnt offerings, but they were not so interested in giving up their bride. They would be willing to give the Lord some of their rams and oil, but they were not going to reform from being unjust in their business practices. They would be glad to give the firstborn of their family, but they were not going to stop committing fraud. You see, the hunger for satisfaction is very powerful, isn't it? We are pleasure-seeking creatures. And we will do almost anything to preserve what makes us feel good. When Mick Jagger sings, and I try, and I try, and I try, and I try, he's talking about the effort that we put in to search for satisfaction, even at the cost of our ethics, our morals, our integrity, and our family. What we need to learn is that the secret to satisfaction has nothing to do with money, nothing to do with power, and nothing to do with real estate. You see, the Lord has already shown us what is good. It's quite simple. We sang about the three things. You heard them in the scripture today. To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. It's shockingly simple. It really is. Acting justly is not just wishful thinking about the administration of justice in the world. To act justly is to do what is right. It is to always be honest, to be truthful, and to be trustworthy. But to act justly is more than just personal honesty. To act justly means to work on behalf of people who are weak and powerless and exploited by others and who are the lowest on the totem pole to receive any justice at all. Acting justly is the opposite of what the rich landowners of Jerusalem were doing as they exploited vulnerable people in their community. It's the opposite of what people do today when they disregard the needs of the weak. There is a sense of well-being and contentment that comes from being honest and doing what is right, not just for oneself, but for others. This is the first step. But once you've discerned what it is to be just and fair, then Micah says we need to turn our attention to mercy. Micah says we should love mercy. We should love when we see mercy being enacted out in the world around us. We shouldn't be critical of somebody who's merciful. We should love mercy. We should say, that's mercy. And mercy, I love mercy. Micah uses a word that makes it a little tricky when we talk about mercy and trying to understand it. It's the Hebrew word hesed. Hesed is a common word in the Bible, but not one that can be translated uh, neatly into one of our English words. Yes, it means mercy, but it also means kindness. Just that simple, kindness. It also means grace. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is something that's beautiful. We know when somebody acts with grace because they act in a beautiful way. Hesed also means loyalty. Hesed means faithfulness. To love Hesed, to love mercy, is to love all of these qualities which are so important to our relationship with God and with our relationship to people around us. You remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees one day when they found him eating with tax collectors and sinners. They were criticizing them, and he turned to them and he said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. As followers of Christ, we are to be people who demonstrate mercy. And finally, Micah says that we should walk humbly with our God, which Barb was talking about here, It's a little tricky and difficult to figure out exactly what that means. But once again, Micah is calling for something that is concrete. He says, walk humbly. This means to travel forward with God in life, walking in God's way and staying close to God. It means to remain humble as we journey through life. 
the two words proud and Christian should never go together in the same sentence. We see lots of people who claim to be proud Christians, superior Christians, don't we? But it shouldn't be that way. The words humble and Christian should always go together. Now, the promise of this verse is the gift of satisfaction. You want some satisfaction? You can get some satisfaction. I need somebody to write a song that'll become as popular as can't get no satisfaction. It needs to be got some satisfaction. When we act justly, when we, tend, when we have good relationships with the people around us, when we love mercy, we can feel as though we are in step with God and we are in step with one another no matter what our station in life is. For you see, true satisfaction doesn't come from achievement. Oh, we think it does, and we want to achieve more and more and more. And true satisfaction doesn't come from property. It doesn't come from having stuff. And true satisfaction doesn't come from power, and it doesn't come from money. Instead, it comes from being right with God and being right with the people around you. What Micah is saying is that God is more interested in the way we live our ordinary lives than in all of our achievements or all of our money or all of the position that people give to us or even our religious practices. God is more interested in the way we live our ordinary lives than in any of those things. And do you know what else? When we act justly, when we love mercy, when we walk humbly with God, we're able to step outside of the rat race. And when we do, there's a feeling that can come over you. And you may not know what that feeling is at first because it's not familiar to us, but it's the feeling of satisfaction. When satisfaction, when satisfaction for the important things of life takes us over, then and only then are we able to hold on to happiness. May it be so for me. May it be so for you. May it be so for all of us. And may it be so for people in our world today, like that gentleman that I'm getting to know. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, we live busy lives. We have great desires to achieve. We are told that we need to make our mark in the world. And we believe it. But our mark doesn't seem to be very big, it doesn't seem to last, and it doesn't satisfy. We know, Lord, that when we die and leave this earth, that life goes on without skipping a beat. And soon, our memory and our work will be surpassed and it will be forgotten. But you tell us, Lord, that there is something that won't be forgotten. And that is if we walked humbly with you, if we loved mercy so much that we went out and showed it, and if we loved justice so much that we were willing to live it, those are the lasting legacies that our life may have. This morning, Lord, we pray for all of the injustice that exists in our world. We pray for the city of Memphis. We pray, Lord, because it breaks our heart to see once again a black man killed unjustly. And we know that this does damage 
uh, to black and to brown people. It causes hurt that maybe doesn't show on the outside, but it's there on the inside. And Lord, we want to do what we can to make that stop. Help us as a church, Lord, to find ways to stand for justice for all people. And we pray, Lord, for the people living under the bridges. Uh, we know that many of them are there because of substance abuse and addiction and alcoholism and mental health. And Lord, we pray for means and ways uh, to be able to lift them out of a life of homelessness. We ask, O oh God, your wisdom and guidance in being able to do so. Help us to be concerned for people in need. And Lord, we pray for ourselves because each one of us here have needs. And some of us are feeling very taxed and overwhelmed by life today. And so we ask that you would help us to rest in you, in your love, in your grace, and in your goodness. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I remind you um, of the opportunity to make offering to the Lord. We're still not passing the offering plates. Um, they're back in the windowsills, and then online you can see a slide how you can contribute. And we thank you in advance uh, for your support of the ministry of this church. We pause to ask God's blessing on all of our gifts. Bless these gifts, O God, and the generosity of those who give them. Through them, may they bring comfort to those in need, peace throughout our community and our world. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our closing hymn. You can find it in the faith that we sing. It's selection 2172. We are called. Let us stand together and sing.
closing song. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and the blessing of God the Father rest upon you and go with you this day and throughout this week. In the name of Christ, amen. amen. Sweets and treats. God bless you. Thank you.